Thank you. <laughs> so I'm Catherine Stedman. I work at um, Christchurch Hospital um, and some in practice as well. Um, so my time split is probably 50-50 between sort of luminal gastroenterology and endoscopies and all that sort of thing and hepatitis work. So tonight focuses on hepatitis C, what's new. Um, so before I get on to what's new, I just thought I'll just revise what's old. Uh, not everything, you'll be very pleased here, and I'm not going to wade through everything there is about hepatitis C. But the key, one of the key things I just want to highlight at the beginning is um, what are the risk factors? So who are the people you should be thinking about that might have hepatitis C? And the reason I bring this up is that I have a lot of people in, in my clinics who come along and they don't look like people with hepatitis C. People have this sort of stereotype of the person with hepatitis C and people aren't all like that. So any history of injecting drug use in the past, and this can in some cases be someone who injected drugs once 30 years ago. So, you know, I have solicitors and professionals and all sorts of people on my box who just had a little slip up sometime in their teenage years. Uh, tattoos uh, certainly are a risk factor for hepatitis C. Uh, and uh, I had a nice young chap a couple of years ago who went and got a tattoo for his 18th birthday and three months later <laughs> he got turned down at the blood bank um, and found out he'd got hep C. So just be aware, you know, it is still transmitted that way. Uh, anyone with a blood transfusion pre-1991, and one of the things here is we often don't actually realise someone had a blood transfusion 30 years ago. The you know, thing I was doing was talk, that well, my mother had a transfusion when she had me. Her GP probably doesn't even know she's ever had a transfusion. So we actually need to be asking our patients these questions. Uh, overseas healthcare, a sexual partner with hepatitis C can be a risk factor, although it's actually not that contagious sexually. So I've, some husbands and wives have had it 30 years and one's got it and one hasn't. Um, but it can be a risk factor. Uh, and a mother with hepatitis C can be a risk factor. Uh, so one of the key things is that there's a cohort of people who were probably infected in the 1970s and 1980s who have now had their disease for a long time. And it's this group in particular that's really important to find. And it's thought to be so important that in America, the uh, American Liver Association and the FDA and people are basically recommending cohort screening of people in their 50s and 60s for hepatitis C in the US. So it really is felt to be quite an important health issue. We're not going quite that far in New Zealand, but we really do want to encourage people to find these people. So the, the big issue is that hepatitis C is largely asymptomatic. And people often, uh, as I say, don't even know they've got it, uh, and so they may have it for a long time. And the problem is, while you have no symptoms or you may just have some vague fatigue, over time you start here with a normal liver at this side of the graph. Over about 20, 30 years, you get to this bad stuff at the other side. So you end up with cirrhosis. Uh, not everybody does, but people can you end up with cirrhosis. Once you've got cirrhosis, <coughs> got a 4% per year risk of liver cancer, risk of liver failure, and all the other issues that go with that. Now, not everyone goes the whole way along that pathway, but quite a proportion of people do. And of course, if you try hard, you can speed it up. So, uh, <laughs> too many nights at the pub. <laughs> Co-infections with Hep B or HIV, or increasingly in our population, of course, obesity. So any of these sort of co-factors, you can get yourself to that side much faster. Um, and of course, the problem is, if you got infected by mum at birth, by the time you're 30, or in fact, I've got a 15-year-old with stage 3 liver fibrosis, so he's right through to here at 15. So you see, and I had a 32-year-old die earlier this year, vertically transmitted. So you know, if you start at birth, you get there quite fast, uh, quite early in your life. So, um, so the big issue really for us as a population is that there was a lot of hep C infection in the 70s and 80s, this whole group are now hitting us as people who've had their infection for 30 years. So they're, they're getting this side of the graph. <coughs> so there's some quite interesting um, sort of epidemiology coming out of Australia, and, and the models are all predicting that the overall prevalence of hepatitis C is actually going to slowly decrease over the next 20 years, partly because of treatment, uh, partly because of you know, safe needle use and education and all these other things, and you know, protective blood supplies and all these things. That the prevalence will decrease, but the models are also showing that this is the, the purple is proportion of people with cirrhosis. So the predictions are, and what we're already seeing in the last decade, we've had a 10% increase in people with cirrhosis. So it's predicted we have a massive increase in people with cirrhosis and the complications from hep C. So this is why we want to get these people. 
we're already seeing in New Zealand the rates of liver cancer are, are steadily climbing. So as you can see, there was a gradual increase up until about 10 years ago, and in the last 10 years, this is New Zealand transplant uh, unit data, this, this is the last 10 years it's gone up like this. And, I, and I've seen that even in my time back at Christchurch Hospital in the last seven years, a lot more HCC coming through now. So, so it's a real problem. So what's the big deal about liver cancer? The big deal about liver cancer really is that if you wait till liver cancer is symptomatic, this is hepatocellular carcinoma, um, which is the way it used to be diagnosed 10 years ago, you waited till a person turned up with tummy pain, you scanned them, you found a great big tumour, and they were usually dead in three months. Median life expectancy was about that. Um, months to live, palliative chemo. The only chemo drug that works against liver cancer costs you $8,000 a month and buys you about three months. Um, so if you wait till that stage, really, it's, it's, it's all over, and it really is still that way if we get them late. But with these people, if we know that, if we can identify them, A, we can treat the hep C. Secondly, we can actually put them in a surveillance program and find their liver cancers early. So if we can find your liver cancer when you've got no symptoms and it's just a little wee white spot on your liver, then there are actually a lot of curative treatments we can look at. So we can um, ablate them, we can do radiofrequency ablation or microwave ablation, odd person might qualify for surgery, or we can even think about liver transplanting in some patients. So there are options uh, for people if we get it early. Who's at risk of liver cancer? So not everyone with hepatitis C is at risk of liver cancer. Uh, and so this is a game. We want to really get these people and stratify them and see who's at risk, who's not, <coughs> what can we do for them. So the people at risk for liver cancer are the people with advanced liver fibrosis or bad liver scarring is what I tell the patients. So basically stage three or four fibrosis, basically the patients who are either cirrhotic or nearly cirrhotic. These are the ones who get liver cancer. Now how do you find that group? How do you know which patient in front of you has got cirrhosis and hasn't? It's not always very obvious when you look at the patient. Uh, in the old days, as in up to 18 months ago, two years ago, we used to do liver biopsies. And uh, some of you might have had that experience of referring your poor patient through and they took six months to be seen by us and then they waited 18 months for a liver biopsy, which they then hated, but you know, three years had gone by and we finally knew whether they were cirrhotic or not. And that was the way it was, um, uh, traditionally. The liver biopsy has some risk as well. What's changed in the last two years, what's new, we've got a machine called a FibroScan. This is ultrasound-based technology and it basically allows us to non-invasively um, separate people into people with advanced fibrosis or you know, normal livers uh, for hepatitis C. So this is great advance. Uh, basically, we have this in the clinic. So in the ideal world, and quite a lot of the time, patient will come to clinic, we'll see them, do their fibre scan. By the time they go home, they know how their liver is. So you can do us a one-stop shop. Sometimes, if, the, if t for other logistic reasons, they might have to come back another day for the fibre scan. Uh, so basically, you can lie on the bed, ultrasound-based technology, do 10 readings, uh, and at the end of it, you can tell the patient. So it's, it really is that quick and that painless. And most of the consultant staff in the department have had these done <laughs> when we were training. There are a few very relieved faces on one of my colleagues once I told them their livers were okay. Uh, <laughs> um, so what sort of report will you get back? Have any of you had a report back on these? Yeah, all oh, good. One or two have, yay. <laughs> um, so you get a sort of report that looks a bit like this at the moment. Um, the key things are, we have a number which is your median score. This is the key thing. So if your median score is over 9.5, then you've got stage 3 or 4 fibrosis. There are some quality things to look at. So we do get the odd one where you just can't get good readings, the numbers are all over the place, and then you'll get a very high intercultural range. So if you get a very high IQR, then we are less confident about the you know, validity of the result. If we get a nice low one like this one, then we're confident about it. But what we will do at the bottom of the form, we tick a box which tells you whether they've got no fibrosis, moderate, significant, or cirrhosis. So it should give you a reasonable idea. Very occasionally we can't get a reading and we have to do a biopsy. But largely we're doing FibroScan. So FibroScan is very good for sorting the people into the group of people who've basically got a normal liver but happen to have a virus versus those who've got a cirrhotic liver, at risk for liver cancer, at risk for liver failure, and this is the group who we, we target now for ultrasound. So this group at the hospital, we then put in a program where they actually have regular six-monthly liver ultrasounds to catch those early signs of cancer, because they've got a 4% per year risk of a cancer. 
Let's poop up the top. We actually don't even need an ultrasound. So we're not routinely ultrasounding the people once we know they've got a normal liver. They don't, we don't ultrasound them at all. And so we're trying to sort of target the ultrasound resource to this group uh, and sort the people out. The other thing is it has an implication for treatment too because some patients want their virus gone and that's great, we'll treat them. Uh, some people say, look, I only want to treat it if I really have to. So if you've got a normal liver, you're someone who really doesn't want the current available treatment, uh, they've got the luxury of waiting. They can say, yes, I'll wait a couple of years till something better has come along and be treated then. So it's very helpful if you know you've got a normal liver, then you can wait. Or if, from my perspective, they come to clinic once, we get the fibrous skin and they never turn up again. Then at least I'm quite comfortable. I think, well, that's all right. They can go away and sort of grow up for a couple of years. And if they come back in a few years' time, they might be ready for treatment then. But I know, at least I know their liver's okay. In contrast, the group with worse liver disease, <coughs> we're going to sort of do what we can to try and treat them uh, as soon as we can. So is hep C worth treating? Uh, and what are the options? Now I'm posing these questions because I, I still get the feeling from quite a lot of people that there's a, there's a feeling out there that the hep C treatment's not really worth it. It's too noxious, it's too horrible. <laughs> Why bother? <laughs> and this is certainly the view I get from some patients. Um, and so what are the options? So my, just my first point here is really to sort of push home the thought that hepatitis C virus is actually a potentially curable virus. So this is a big plus for it, really. You know, if you're going to have a virus, at least we can get rid of this one. Hep B, you know, very hard to actually get rid of. Um, so hep C is potentially curable, and in fact, if we get this thing called a sustained virological response, if you get a letter from me saying this person's got an SVR, what that means is that they've been off their treatment for six months, their viral load is still undetectable, that is basically a cure. So it means <coughs> if you follow them up five, ten years, basically in sort of 99% of cases, they will remain aviremic, and they won't get progressive liver disease. So you do cure them. Probably about 1%. Uh, re either relapse, but in fact I think most of them reinfect because often if you do the genotype it's changed. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> yeah, that's one of the hazards of the job. Um, so, so first point, hepatitis C actually is curable. Now at the moment we can't cure everybody, we'd like to, but we can't. But you know, if we do get rid of it, it's gone for good. So this is a good thing to treat. It's quite satisfying. Uh, is it worth treating if the person's already got cirrhosis? You know, when I was at medical school, the dogma was once you've got cirrhosis, it's basically all over. <laughs> you know, the liver's had it. Uh, it's all scarred. It's irreversible. Yeah, and, and there was this thought, well, why bother treating? It's too late to treat. But in fact, if you get a person who's got cirrhosis from hepatitis C and you get rid of their virus, if you get this SVR, uh, then in fact their mortality curves start to separate within 12 months. So you get a rapid change in life expectancy and in morbidity. You prevent things like esophageal varices developing, you get a drop in their portal pressure so their varices are less likely to bleed if they do have varices. Uh, and over you know, seven to ten years follow up there's a big difference in mortality and morbidity and rates of transplantation etc. There is still some ongoing risk of liver cancer though because you've done the cellular damage already. I tell patients it's like um, you know, the old farmers who've had sunburn all their lives, you know, the sunburn heals up, but they, they, start, they start growing cancers and they keep growing cancers, even though they're not getting sunburn. It's about the same with the liver. If you've got to the cirrhotic point, you're at risk of liver cancer, even if we get rid of the cause. But we do, we, we basically remove the risk of liver failure. So what are the treatment options? So traditional treatment for hepatitis C has always been interferon-based. Interferon-based, I tell patients, it revs up your immune system, so you try and get rid of the virus all by yourself. Um, the trouble with interferon, some of you may have... Who's had patients do interferon? Oh, lots. Bad experience? Good experience? Bad. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a horrible drug, really. It's a horrible, horrible drug. You have about a 30% risk of significant depression on interferon. We try and mitigate that by giving prophylactic citalopram, horrible drug, um, which does, you know, there's trial data to show you get less depression if you give the citalopram beforehand, so we do do it. Um, but, you know, it's, it's nasty. It makes them angry and irritable. They don't sleep. They lose about seven kilos of weight, which the women like and the men hate. Uh, <laughs> um, they get bone marrow suppression, so we get these horrible, you'll see the horrible blood results come through. The neutrophils are 0.5 and the hemoglobin has gone from 150 down to 100 and, you yeah. Or their blood drop. Um, so it's tough treatment. It does work in some people. 
but I mean, it is contraindicated in some people, you know, people with bad psychiatric disease, you just can't go there. Um, and it's refused by some patients too. They just go, oh, I had a friend who did it, I'm never touching it. Um, having said that, we, you know, we do treat people with interferon and we get some quite good success rates. If you look at this as Australasian data, I'm sorry, I hope you can see. Um, so the key thing here is that it depends how bad your liver disease is. So if you've got, there's this sort of paradox. The people who need it the least have the best cure rates. So can you see those pictures? I'll move around a bit. So if you've got a normal liver, this end, if you've got genus like one hep C, if we treat you with peg interferon, you've got no scarring in your liver. In fact, 60 to 70% chance of a cure with interferon. That's pretty good. Problem is, as you go down the other end and you get to the cirrhotic liver, you're down around a sort of 10% chance of it actually working. One in 10. So you go through a year of pain and agony for one in 10 chance of a cure. Now, if you're the one in 10, it's good. But if you're the nine out of 10, it's pretty dismal. So there's a lot of work with hepatitis C trying to sort of learn from HIV and hepatitis B and say, well, rather than just stimulating the immune system, what about suppressing the virus, stopping the virus from replicating? So this is a picture of the hep C life cycle. You don't have to memorise it. Uh, <laughs> but basically it's showing there's, there's various mechanisms in the life cycle, the, the boxes are different types of drugs that are in development. Uh, to stop the virus replicating. And the, the, the idea behind this is if you can inhibit the virus down to a very, very low level, then the body's immune system seems to reconstitute and actually get rid of the virus. Um, so first generation of these drugs are actually about to be funded. Um, so first generation of these drugs called the protease inhibitors. Uh, there's a drug called Bocep, unfortunately Pharmac have gone with Bocepreveer, which would be my least favourite, but that's what tends to happen in life. Um, now the issue with these very first generation of these drugs is that if you give them on their own, what happens? The virus goes down for a week, then it mutates, <laughs> and then it comes straight back up again, which is not terribly effective. Uh, so the only way you can use these new drugs is adding them on to the interferon. So rather than having two interfer interferon and ribavirons, you've got two sort of nasty drugs, you add in a third nasty drug. Um, essentially. Uh, so they get more side effects. Again, they get skin rashes, which are worse. They can get Stevens-Johnson syndrome, nasty. Um, so if they get a rash, ring us. Um, they get worse anemia. So we've, we've got a bit of experience with these drugs. Um, we've had some patients, um, haemoglobins go from 150 at baseline down to about 80, 70, 80 in a couple of weeks. It's a pretty quick drop. They haemolize. Um, so Clearly, you don't really want to rush into that with someone with cardiovascular disease or cerebrovascular disease. Or, you know, it's a wee bit um, tricky. So, but they do, they do improve your cure rates, particularly in the people with worse disease, with cirrhosis. You can increase your cure rate from about 10% to about 50%. So you do get a gain in terms of cure, and that gain does translate to long-term survival if, you, if, you, if you're one of the lucky ones. Um, but it's a huge pill burden, it's a long, difficult treatment, and it doesn't work very well in people who haven't responded to interferon. Uh, and there's also some big safety issues in people with severe liver disease. So I think this is the first step. We will use these drugs, but we'll use them sparingly. Is there something better? Obviously, that's what you'll all be thinking. <laughs> Can we do better than this interferon-based treatment? This is what the patients want. Uh, so there's one drug that we've done a lot of work with in Christchurch. We're very lucky, in fact. New Zealand's probably treated the most people in the world with this drug, between Christchurch and Auckland. Uh, a drug called Cephospivir. It's actually out there in the media. It's all over the internet. Your patients with hepatitis C are finding this drug on the internet now. Uh, so basically, this is a polymerase inhibitor. It inhibits the viral polymerase, which stops the virus reproducing. Um, the drug looked good when we started studying it. Once daily dose... Um, no drug interactions, no significant side effects. It's, quite, it's very remarkable for its lack of side effects, I have to say. Uh, and a high barrier to resistance, so they don't get resistance. And it works against all the strains of hep C, which the other drugs don't. So looking quite promising. Um, we've done a, quite a lot of studies of this drug now in Christchurch. Uh, we did one study a couple of years ago, over the time of the earthquake, actually, um, which really was proof of concept, looking at the question globally, um, can you cure hep C without interferon? So we're really one of the first groups in the world to ever look at that. 
so basically we took 40 patients, the initial study, 40 patients, genotype 2 or 3, they all got this drug, had a number at that stage, but sulfosbuvir, plus ribavirin, and then they got either 12 weeks, 8 weeks, 4 weeks, or no interferon. So it was really testing this hypothesis, can you get rid of hep C without interferon, if you've got a good enough drug. Uh, and if you look at our uh, cure rates, we had 100% cure rate across the board. So that was um, seen as quite a big breakthrough, really, in medicine. Uh, this is some data that we presented earlier this year in Europe, actually. Um, we did a study looking at genotype 1, which is traditionally the hardest type of hep C to treat, and we took patients who were basically untreated before or people who had failed to respond to all previous treatment, the null responders. Um, the blue graph shows what the sulfosbuvir ribavirin on its own without interferon did, so we got about 80% cure rate in the naive patients, but it didn't work in those who'd failed previous treatment. Uh, we then added in another drug called lidipasvir, which is another one of these new drugs, and we, again, have got 100% cure, even if people had failed previous treatment. Um, and the remarkable thing about this has been the lack of side effects. Patients just take the pills and they actually feel better than usual because their virus is suppressed. <laughs> so um, really we've had no serious side effects at all. We've treated about 150 patients locally with this. Um, no side effects. Fabulous drug to use. It uh, doesn't cure everybody at 100% rate. Some of the phase 3 data, some of the genotype 3s who failed previous treatment or people with cirrhosis with genotype 3 actually more disappointing. So there's a lot of ongoing work looking at combinations. Uh, the thing that I'm quite excited about at the moment, we've got some cohorts of patients with cirrhosis, cohorts of patients who failed previous therapies, and we've even got, for the first time ever, a cohort of people who've got sort of liver failure, child's pu B, uh, cirrhosis, and you know, liver, early stages of liver failure on treatment, trying to treat them, and that's a group you just never touch with interferon, you kill them. Uh, so quite exciting in the sense that there's some things happening, some new things happening. Uh, so we actually do now know, you know, we've actually seen it in our patients, hepatitis C is curable in this 12-week all-oral interferon-free regime with actually almost no side effects. So, you know, I'm looking forward, I'd say, you know, 10, 10 years' time, you guys will be doing it. Uh, <laughs> you won't need us at all. The, my cautionary note here is just to say, though, so that you give your patients a sort of a, a realistic view of the life, uh, currently, the only registered or funded treatment for hepatitis C anywhere in the world is still interferon. <laughs> Interferon-based treatment with these, those protease inhibitors added in. So, uh, so there's a, a gulf between what we now know can be done, and we are seeing in some people who are lucky enough to get in the trials, uh, can be with what's actually available globally for everyone else. I think interferon-based treatment still has a role, and I still do treat people with interferon. Um, particularly the people who can't afford to wait. You know that there's just no way you can get them into a drug trial. Um, they've got quite bad fibrosis. Or some of them you can do the gene, do gene studies and work out that they have very favourable characteristics for interferon, then it's well worth a go. So, so we still do use interferon-based treatment because ultimately we still want to get rid of this virus and we don't actually know how long it's going to be till these new drugs are registered and funded in our country. The only way to get them is going in drug trials at the moment. Um, so we've got this phenomenon at the moment with hepatitis C. Patients get referred. We're really quite keen to get them referred so that we can sort out who's got bad liver disease, who hasn't, who do we need to look for liver cancer and who don't we. And then we've got this whole sort of minefield of treatment. So we're not, it's not a sort of quick move on to treatment for everybody. We don't just... It used to be a sort of one-stop shop. You came in and the only treatment was interferon, so you made a decision, yes or no, and you either got treated or you didn't, and that was it. Now it's a lot more complicated because... There's a group we treat with interferon. There's a group we're waiting, we're going to use Bisepavir when it's funded in a couple of weeks' time, with, along with interferon. And then there are other people that we might say, well, actually, why don't you wait, because I think I can get you into a trial in six months' time or 12 months' time. Or actually, you know, someone who's a sort of nervous wreck, I'm never going to give you interferon. Why don't you just wait three or four years until one of these new drugs is actually funded? So very much more this, it's more of a sort of ongoing discussion with the patient about what they want to do, do they want to try interferon, do they want to do a drug trial, are they philosophically opposed to drug trials, in which case they're just going to wait. So it's a bit more of a sort of ongoing dialogue and we've got some big database that we put everyone into and then try and match them up, it's a bit of a, a process these days. So I guess my key three messages for the night, number one, 
There is this epidemic of hepatitis C, it's kind of under the surface, it's asymptomatic, um, and there's an increasing pool of people out there who are at risk for hepatitis C related complications. And I think a lot of them are out in your practices, and so just keen to raise your awareness, I guess, of, of thinking about referring some of those patients through. You know, you don't have to send them all this week. <laughs> Gradually would be nice. <laughs> um, you know, FibroScan, I think, has really given us a tool um, to provide non-invasive assessment of these livers. The other big spin-off, just for your information, is that it's slashed the waiting list for all other invasive biopsies at the hospital. Because <laughs> we've taken this huge pool of people out of the waiting list from radiology. Um, and treatment options are changing rapidly. So, you know, you'll get the odd patient you'll refer who just hits the jackpot and they get referred the same week we've got a good trial for them. <laughs> and before you know it, they're on some wonderful treatment. But other patients, it is this process of waiting and trying to get the best thing for them over a couple of year period. But certainly we know the treatment options are changing, so you can tell patients that. That's all for me. Just, I'll just point out Jenny to you too. <coughs> Jenny here um, is a nurse in the Hepatitis C Community Clinic. So um, we take referrals both from you guys and from Jenny and her team. Um, so Jenny has very close links with the whole methadone program as well and sees all the new people going on methadone to screen them for hepatitis C. Uh, and she's also got a good resource for patients. We sort of provide a, a linking service. I mean, we link with, with the GPs and with our drug services and with the treatment providers. And we, we provide testing and management and sort of treatment readiness. Mm. We, uh, Which is quite a big issue with hepsi patients. They're more complicated or chaotic ones, but um, you know, if, if, if anybody wants to, I think I've left a wee card there, wants to either have a chat or, or send somebody through, we we'll take anybody that might be a bit more challenging. Jenny's team are great sort of support. Some is with people on treatment or on a trial that are a little bit challenged in terms of their ability to organise their lives. <laughs> <laughs> and and Jenny's team are quite good actually, <laughs> assisting with getting them to appointments or making sure they know where they're meant to be and when. And because you know, it's, it's sometimes quite a challenging group of patients in terms of their their life skills are not quite there sometimes.